On this week's episode of The Pole Line, we've got uh, Invercargill's own Chris Chatty Chatfield, truck driver by day, um, 78i Paul Humphreys, passenger by night. How you going today, Chris? Yeah, good as man, yourself? Before we get going, promote everything you want to do with your team. Let everyone know. Oh, yeah, I just race on the side of Paul Humphreys bike there, the 78i sidecar team. We've got a Facebook page there if you want to follow that and see what we get up to during the season. You don't just walk down the street and come across a Speedway sidecar. So how did all this start for you? Uh, probably in 2010. I didn't even know what sidecars were, mate. I only come in about 2010. My um, current partner took me along to one of the Burt Munro meetings. She said, oh, I'll come along and have a, have a watch without her and her workmates just to go along and have a big booze up. So I went along and, um, yeah, pretty much hot line and sinker straight out of the gate watching four or five years and then uh, thought, oh, I reckon I could do that and had a go one day and thought, no, we'll have a crack at this. So we've just been going ever since. You've actually had a go on a solo as well. So what was the story with that? Uh, that that's one of them drunken chats where you just thought, oh, love to have a go. You know, I've got a couple of mates here, Alex Cunningham and a few of the other boys there that they think we're crazy getting on the side of a sidecar, but you get on them solos and there's something different, mate. I've got to take my hat off to them. It's, it's hard work. But the solos, I have no idea how you could ride them and let alone ride them at an elite level. I thought I was going pretty good, going pretty fast, but when you watch the video clip, I look like a um, uh, yeah, little kid riding around out there, <laughs> getting the speed wobbles down the back straight and whatnot. Now, I've got to stitch you up on this. You, as a Kiwi, have actually raced for Australia on the back with Steve Saunders. That had to hurt literally and emotionally. So what was the deal with that? Oh, I think I caught more ribbing from my mates about racing for the uh, Australian side. But no, she's all good. That just come by chance. Um, I think his sister was meant to be on, but she must have hurt herself. Uh, I don't know, must breed him weak in Aussie. Nah, jokes. Yeah, nah, that just come about, just got lucky. He messaged me on Facebook, said he was looking for someone for the series. I was on with Claire Hartnell at the time and she wasn't partaking in the series, so I was able to double up for some of the meetings and I gave him all, everything I had and we had a good time. Now, from memory, you guys went upside down, I think, not even 50 metres into one of the races. What happened there? Yeah, that was our first heat. I think we just got out of the gate and it got a bit wobbly on us and we, we copped a couple of smack from the side and, yeah, the bike just tipped over on its side. It sort of bucked over a little bit and that was us. We brushed ourselves off and we had another crack. Continuing on with the Australian sort of thing, because I'm dying to know this, I, I actually took a break from Speedway. And <clears throat> in that time, I'm pretty sure you came over with Paul Humphreys to run some Australian stuff. So what, what sort of happened with that? Uh, yeah, so Paul bought um, one of the South Coast custom frames that was already set up in Australia. And uh, he asked, that's when I first started swinging for him, he, he asked me to jump on to have a go in Aussie. So I've always wanted to to race against those guys over there. They seem to be the um, the pinnacle mark as such to to chase them around in their own home turf is something pretty cool. So I jumped at that chance and uh, got over there for the East Coast series there that Jeff and Jeff Garnham runs. Uh, meeting in North Brisbane there as a, as a sort of like a warm up to the start of the series, just to get a feel for the bike and, see if I could uh, change a few of the ways that I swung because I was still, you know, I'm still very much learning. I'm only sort of new to the game as such when you talk to some of the other people. Yeah, learned a lot and had a good time over there. The tracks were massive and that was, of course, the first time we got to see the lights of Down Trelaw race and I was sort of blown away by that a little bit. It was something different. What did you find with the sort of differences between Australia and New Zealand uh, on the back of a bike 
even since then to now. Service over there is produce a lot more dirt. Like a lot of a lot of our meetings were catered to the sidecar class in uh, in Aussie, so they produced some quite nice deep dirt that you could use a lot of the horsepower for. Found over there, like you needed. It was more of a horsepower game, like you could use the horsepower a bit more. It's a little less wheel spin. The bike could almost rip your arms off. Over here, you're sort of trying to chase that grip a little bit more. Over there, it was a little bit more free to grab a hold off. Bear in mind, we were only sort of learning that bike and gearing, so I think we got didn't do too bad, really, considering. It's a big deal to go to another country, but when you got back... What was the sort of racing schedule like for you and did you and Paul sort of gel together a lot better? Yeah, yeah, we sort of got we got better as the season. We sort of struggled when we first got the bike back just to, just to uh, get it dialed back in again. Made a hell of a lot of changes. It sort of just come on for us in the last uh, couple of seasons. You're always improving though, like you're always trying to make a little change to you know, the way you swing or a bit of a bike set up to, to chase that little bit of advantage that you could get from someone else. What are some of your rituals on the on the bike or leading up to it that calm you down to be able to race? Uh, it's funny, we actually just talked about this last night. Um, I sort of, the, the couple of days leading up to a meeting, it's kind of an odd thing to think about, but I think about uh, basically the meeting and, and the, uh, coming up and the people that are racing, um, sort of just try and get my nerves out the, the few days before. Apart from that, I just on race day, I don't, I sort of have, try to have a bit of a breakfast, but I don't eat much during the day. Maybe some jet planes or some wine gums or something like that, and keep the sugars up and just drink some water. That's about it. In the racing I've seen, you sort of get grouped with the same riders for your heats and stuff. And sometimes, you know, that can make people really good or it can give you a bad run and it's hard to deal with. But who's the most frustrating competitor to be against because you just can't quite get them or they're always on your on your sort of back sort of thing? There's always that one that you want to beat and that's the go with the one NZ plate. And at the moment, that's um, JD and Harley Biddle. We usually have a pretty good duo battle with them they're pretty much rolling the same frame and similar motor similar motor um they're always a good battle but at the moment yeah bradley sharp's given us a good we're one for one pretty much the season just been i think he won up won up us there i think at the end on home meetings so he's been giving us a good battle it's it's always good to go out there and and race at full steam with these lads and then be able to just sit back and have a drink afterwards and have a bit of a laugh about it, you know? Yeah, you're part of the Broken Back Club. I didn't do mine in a cool way. I wasn't racing. I did it at work and wasn't that great. But tell me the story with your Broken Back. What actually happened and how long did it sort of put you out for? Uh, well, my broken back, I, I have a, a prolapse disc in my back. A lot of people probably don't actually realise, but I raced with like um, four titanium rods that are lodged in my back and I've got a bone graft over one of my discs. So I'm actually minus a disc at the bottom. And then this, that was done That was done at work just uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I think I had that done. Had that operation that probably put me out for about nine months. And that's when I come on the speedway scene, believe it or not. So some people find that a bit weird. It's not a real good, cool story. I didn't do it in a mean speedway crash or anything like that. It's just a work incident. And then uh, the season just been, I actually put a tear in the next disc above at the start of about this time last year. So I raced the whole last season with a torn disc and just a lot of physio pretty much after every meeting to chase it to to rehab so I can actually go back to work and continue racing. So, so. That's the problem with um, doing any sort of extracurricular activity, especially speedway, bikes and sidecars. It's hard on the body, but also it's hard on your employer. Now, uh, people that I know locally that are Kiwis that race like Bailey Ogilvy and that, he 
pretty much races around his work schedule and it takes him all over the country. But how do you find the balance between sort of work and play, I guess? Uh, work are pretty good. I just I just got a – I only work for like Monday to Friday, so get every weekend off, which pretty much frees it up for Speedway. And then uh, if I've got to take a Friday or a Monday off, I just sort of give them a couple of weeks' notice and they're pretty – pretty lenient and with letting me have the time off. Talked about this with other people, but New Zealand have got the world FIM World Sidecar title next year. I'm coming over for the first round. Um, what can I look forward to with the – I'm dying to know about the canteens – and also the people with the hospitality? Uh, you'll probably find the hospitality second to none, mate. They'll just bring you in like family and um, treat you just as one of the crew, really. Moving along from that, you've actually got a cool little um, car that I've been sort of staring at a fair bit. I know it's a Falcon wagon, but give us the rundown on it. Uh, my 69 XT, is that the one you're talking about? That's exactly the one. Uh, that was actually, yeah, the rundown on that, uh, that was our uh, wedding car that my mate owned and we come back from the States and uh, come up for sale. So I just grabbed my mitts on that and probably won't let that go. That's actually the daughter's car. So <laughs> Again soon. What are you and Paul, what are your plans for racing and sort of where where do you reckon you'll end up racing this, this coming season? Uh, at the moment, it's probably just going to be, uh, the home track already park in um, Moore Park. And then hopefully all going well, we'll get up to the New Zealand set Rosebank in Auckland and it's pretty much just going to be us, I think. It's getting a bit pricey to get around, so we'll just smack those out and have a go at that. Now, i got to know, what is the, I would say, the most technical track you've been on on a sidecar that's really caught you out, but you sort of learnt to progress with it as the as the meeting went on. Uh, the most technical one that I've been to would be Cosa Mesa in the States. So that's a um, it's a very small, small track. Yeah, racing in the States is something different. It's a very tiny track. You could pretty much they hose it down with a just a yeah, normal garden hose from home. But the most technical one, probably North Brisbane, to be fair. I felt like that was pretty technical. I mean, it probably looks pretty normal to use, but I found that to be pretty interesting track, just a different sort of shape at both ends and managed to progress quite well to make the final in there. So we're pretty happy with that. Do you see yourself being able to come back over to Oz to do any racing or is it sort of out of reach at the minute? Uh, it's probably out of reach at the moment, just, yeah, with the price of travel and everything like that. I think when we went over there, we were lucky to get um, some good sponsorship behind us and and just luckily to be in a, in a position where we could have a go, but it was, yeah, it was quite pricey before you even hit the dirt. Insurance alone, I think, was like 1500 odd bucks just for one meeting for me to race over there. I think I think that's what it was. Well, I might have been, yeah, around, around around 1000 bucks or something just for me to get on your track to race. Whereas you just don't have to worry about that when you come over here as such. I don't think you do. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to get back over there and have another go. I mean, it's always fun. But we'll just see what the future brings, I guess. I'm really stoked that I'm going to be able to come over next year and I'm really looking forward to it. But I think you guys are pretty spoiled too with that Aridi Park because even the the solo guys watch everything on YouTube about it. It looks like an awesome venue. Yeah, yeah. It's improving every year. Like we just tidied up the in, the, the crew just tidied up the infield this year and now they've got a concrete pole line down and, um, so it look, should look pretty shit hot come uh, this season. Yeah, it's an improving place. The, the facility there is actually growing quite nicely. Just trying to get the competitive numbers up now and 
the track's always it's a good time. I, I quite enjoy racing down here. When you sort of come into it and you were sort of learning, who were the people that were really helping you out and sort of give you a hand now with tips and tricks? There's a few. When I first started out, um, there was the likes of Nigel Cookout who swung for Irwin Tree. There was Irwin Tree. I uh, started swinging for Bradley Sharp. So he was helping as well. And, and his brother, you know, they were giving you pointers. Probably, probably the worst thing I could have done was I listened to too many people. Should have just listened to one person and, um, and the rider. But that's all good. You live and you learn. And then uh, they, all, they all taught me the basics. And then... Um, my first New Zealand champ, so um, good friend Jacob Cooper, or, or AKA Rope, so Ropey. Yeah, he probably taught me a bit about racing on clay, so he's helped me improve my my um, racing on clay. But probably in the last three seasons with Paul Way, just communicating with Paul, I've probably learnt more. You know, actually looking at videos and photos and trying to see how I can improve. Just those minute improvements to help. And we sort of thanked a few people that have helped you out but um with your team and your sponsors and you know you you got to thank your missus and that but who who would you like to thank while you sort of can oh i'd like to thank paul for letting me on for the last three years three three years Shit, been that long. um yeah yeah i mean he he obviously owns the bike and brings a lot of the sponsors and a lot of the effort in behind the scenes as well uh, yeah, I suppose the wife. It's like thank the wife, <laughs> and just all the people that um like we got our team sponsors like Alvin at Southern Bolts and Fastness and um Josh Heenan at Heenan Small Engines here in town and um uh, uh Sean Kerr at Sign Solutions. What else we got? We got Sheet Metal Craft. Where Paul works. Uh, my brother at Southern Lawn Services just for helping us out during the season. And uh, oh yeah, Alvin at Southern Bolts and Fasteners, who's now the track sponsor down here. He helps us out big time. He actually followed us all the way to Aussie. It was a good chat about that one, I can tell you. But yeah, and of course my partner for letting me go away. Like when we first started racing in Aussie, uh, my wee girl was only six weeks old, I think, and I was shipping up for a weekend in Aussie, so I left her to it. But sort of had to make sure all the bases were covered, and she had some help come around like my mum and stuff um, come around and help her when I went away but definitely my partner eh, for still letting me do this <laughs> I'd do it without her uh, The front disc over the wheel I, I wasn't sure that that was a rule but I think it's a pretty cool safety thing Yeah that's one of the um, Speedway New Zealand rules like obviously you've got your FIM rules and your Aussie rules and then Everyone tries to run under the FIM banner, I guess, as such. It's kind of like um, the mud flaps over here. We're only allowed them about 20 mil off the ground. So you get you do get covered in a little bit, but you go to Aussie and the roosters that come off some of them bikes, you're just, yeah, you're that. And you're 30, 40 metres behind, you're still getting walloped. So when we raced at Newcastle, it, it was yeah, when you got hit with the chip, or what we call chip seal, it's coming, and the old Kumo there was uh, bleeding. I never experienced that before. Yeah, I think it's great. And since I've come back, um, unfortunately, at um, Philippa Burns' expense, we've come up with the under trays, which I think is a great thing. And she's very positive about her career and you know her accident and moving forward to be helpful towards safety. But as we're sort of winding up on time, is there anything you've thought of that could be sort of implemented or not really? No, not really, man. I mean, um, to me, it's it's probably jumped tenfold in the last few years when it comes to the safety when you look at some of those older bikes. And they could probably change their helmets to go much like the motocross ones where they have the, the ear valve in the back for the uh, – they have a – like a balloon underneath your head 
So, like, if you have a crash or get knocked out, they just pull the front off and then push the gas in the back, and, of course, it pops the helmet off, so you're not actually bringing the neck. But that would be just another expense. Though. Those helmets wouldn't be cheap, I'd imagine. But you only got one noggin, eh? An old solo guy told me once when I was a little kid and I was too young to understand it, but I do now. I used to say, you got a $2 head, you got a $2 helmet, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's the one, eh? Um, yeah, I suppose. I'm probably going to look at running an air vest this year, which might be a bit of a niggle to start off with. I might get blown up like a buddy Mitchell and Dole um, a few times, just forgetting to unclip it when I get off but I'm looking at um, probably running one of them just to to help the back I guess if, if anything does go wrong Thank you for being part of the movement in um, New Zealand races that are coming on here and you know telling me a bit about yourself and I, I look forward to going over there next year and meeting you in person Yes yeah, sweet man it's um, cheers for what you're doing eh? pushing the sport out there she's all good and uh, Yeah, we look forward to catching up at Moor Park for a cheeky bevy afterwards at the shed.